Welcome to the first part of this lecture on the global rise of zero liquid discharge. I am Alice Peters and I'm a senior lecturer at Newcastle University in the School of Engineering. So by background, I am a polymer chemist. So I've been involved in developing polymers that can be used to determine water quality. So for screening of environmental contaminants in water, such as antibiotics. And therefore I also have an interest in clean drinking water and water quality. And this is a real problem. So while we all have clean water, we have access to it via the tap. I think you all know that there are millions of people who don't have that luxury. And actually the UN as one of its sustainable development goals is to have for everyone to have access to clean water. So the goal of this project then is really to maximize the use of water. So having as little waste as possible. And what I would actually like to show you that there we've been working on a slightly unusual case is where we're actually using a combination of the brewing industry. So we're using something which is seen as a waste from the brewing industry and applying this into concrete. So in this way, in concrete normally uses a lot of water, by combining the waste from one industry and applying it to something else, we should really maximize the usage of water. And obviously you never work on your own. There's a large team of people that are involved in this. So besides the PhD students and postdocs working on this, we'd like to introduce you to some other people. And you will see that it's really multidisciplinary and they all have a different role to play. So I moved to Newcastle University about a year and a half ago. And previously I was working at Manchester Metropolitan University. So this is where I met Dr. Tedesco, who is an expert in anaerobic digestion. And through the Royal Society of Cremative Street, who have their monthly meetings, I also got in touch with Anna Sash from Leeds Beckett University. So he mainly works in construction and concrete. So as you can see, all of this seems to be like a really very different discipline. So it's difficult to imagine how they all come together. Now, in this particular project, and I think I met Ash about two years ago, potentially at this meeting of Royal Society of Chemistry, he had an interest into using sustainability or to have things in the construction industry where we can improve its sustainability. Now, obviously, that wasn't really my expertise. But what's interesting about this, by getting him in touch with Sylvia, who is in anaerobic digestion, and my background in the sensing, so in an analytical chemistry to look what's going on and the characterization of the material, we started working together on this project. And recently we published the first paper that came out of it. So here you can see that we used this brewery digestate as a potential water substrate in concrete applications. So this is a very novel application for this. And what I am going to do in this lecture is show you some of the results that we achieved. So looking at, for instance, the mechanical strength for the concrete, some of the factors that can really complicate what we're trying to do and show how we can go further from this. And in order to do that for you, I first need to give you like a background in what anaerobic digestion is. The global amount of wastewater uh, exceeds, well, it's nearly 400 billion uh, cubic meter. So there's a large amount of wastewater. And in wastewater, you actually got a lot of organic compounds. You've got a lot of minerals. So in a way, while we class it as wastewater, you can see the value in it and potentially it could be used for other applications. But in order to do this, you would often need to deactivate the pathogens in there and you need to convert the organic compounds into something useful. Now, the way anaerobic digestion works is that you feed it with something which is seen as waste. Uh, which can be solid waste, so it can be agricultural, it can be animal waste, even municipal waste. Or you can look at, for instance, the sludge that comes from wastewater treatment. So you feed this into the reactor, so as it implies, it's anaerobic, so it doesn't use oxygen. And there, bacteria will convert it into biogas. What biogas composed of, you will see in the next slide. And that biogas can then be converted into electricity or, for instance, heat. So basically, you're generating energy from something that is seen as waste. However, not everything in the reactor can be digested. 
you will have compounds, uh, and it's quite a lot of it actually, that will remain as a digestate. So that's the things that the bacteria can't convert. Um, so even though we start off with waste, you obviously want to use up as much of the waste as possible. So what we were trying to do is to find alternative applications for this digestate. And if you talk about biogas, what it is composed of, you can see that it's composed of a couple of different gases. But the one that we actually, if you took the, the one that we're after for in terms of energy, this is mainly methane. And here you can see roughly what volumes there are in certain compounds. So you can see, for instance, there will also be carbon dioxide, there will be water vapor. So even if you have biogas, you probably will need to purify it in order to get what you want. So to put this into comparison, here you can see what happens when you have biogas that's only a certain percentage of methane. And you can see that the energy content really goes down quite a lot. So it is probably key to purify it to make sure that you remove some of the other compounds in here. But as I said, here we are not necessarily so much actually interested in the biogas. Our interest is in the digestate. So that's what we'll be looking at. And what does it look like and what is actually in it that we can use? So as I said before, the digestate is the residual that you get after the anaerobic digestion. So it's very rich in uh, nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. So that means that potentially, and I think you can imagine applications where there's a, a high demand for nitrogen and potassium, it is often used as fertilizer because these are the compounds that plants actually need to grow. However, because of the harsh environment within the reactor, it's not just rich in these compounds, there are potentially other things in there. So this might be uh, high heavy metals, there might be hormones, there might be pesticides. So it really depends on the reactor that you're using and the condition. So you're not quite sure what you're getting. And below you can see a picture of some of the digestate. So it will be a mixture of solids and liquids. So this also depends on how you will treat it. So you can remove some of the liquid so you get the cake, but you can also have something which is relatively low. So let's say one to 5% in solid content. So it's very watery. And here you can see this process why they try to filter it. So as you can see, in order to remove uh, some of the contaminants, you really have to put a lot of work into it. Now then there are some of the applications of the digestate. If it's quite liquidy, so then we're looking at the, the relatively low solid content, this is often employed as fertilizer. So that's the main application. You will see some other ones later on. But in order for farmers to actually apply to this, it needs to be compliant with certain guidelines. And these guidelines are quite strict and they will look at exactly what the composition of the digestate is in order to make sure that there are no environmental concerns when you put this on the land. And what this means is that even though this is a good use of waste, of waste there is a certain implications in the costs. Um, particularly for small uh, farming businesses, this can be quite considerate. So you would have to imagine that they have to pay quite a lot in order to purify it, in order to establish and to comply with these guidelines. So even though it's waste, it doesn't mean that it's for free. Yeah? So there are some challenges associated with using this as fertilizer. Now, we're also not quite sure uh, about certain aspects on how you get the buildup from, because you can imagine there might be materials in there. For instance, they will probably check for heavy metals, but can you imagine that there might be buildup of certain level of hormones as well, which they don't necessarily check for within these guidelines. So that might be a problem. The other problem when you might apply it on the land is that it can further degrade. So you get the buildup of other uh, gases that, you, that are not wanted. Biogas you can do in a very sophisticated reactor. If you want to do it in a really simple way, and you have to imagine this takes time. No? So this is not a, a process that happens within a day, it takes a lot of time. You could just dig a hole in the ground. You could have your waste in there and the bacteria would do the job for you. So it can be as simple as having a hole in the ground and just waiting until your biogas is automatically formed. I would, I'm not going to say this is the most efficient way, but it is possible. 
Now, if you want to have a look at the different uses for the Just Take piece, have a look at this website. And besides fertilizer, which I've already mentioned, there are a couple of more niche applications that are kind of growing in strength and people are starting to look at it more and more. So some of them might be quite surprising, such as the use in the mushroom industry. Um, some of them are a little bit more logical in terms of bioethanol production. And there was one potential application that I found in the construction industry. It was about making composites from the suggestite often has this fiber-like structure. So making use of this fiber-like structure to build composites. But the use of this potential uh, digestate in concrete application hasn't been explored yet. So this is very novel about the work that we're doing. And the first thing you then have to ask yourself is why we are actually looking at concrete. And why haven't people looked at it before? So if you think about when you produce concrete, you use a large amount of water to produce it, much more than you can potentially think. So in that way, what we were thinking is, is there a way of how we can replace the water that we're using to produce the concrete with some of the digestate? It doesn't necessarily have to be all of the water, but even if we can reduce like a small percentage of it, that would already be a win. And there are a lot of challenges that come with this. So obviously this was not an obvious or a trivial matter. When you are producing the concrete, you want to make sure that it has a proper flow so it's easy to work with. And this is related to the workability. So the first thing that you might wonder if you've got something which is not pure water, obviously it has a certain amount of solid content, would that affect the flow of the material? And are we still able to produce uh, the concrete as we want? The second is that concrete Obviously, it, you can get wear and tear over time, but one of the key things that actually destroys the concrete is the presence of sulfur, because it can attack it and it will weaken it over time. And this has certain implications on the mechanical strength. So you would want to also very carefully check the, the, the composition of the digesters to find out not just the sulfur, but what are the other uh, elements that are actually present in there. And first of all, the most important bit is, would it retain its mechanical strengths when you start replacing it? So these are all of the kind of questions that we had. And as we went along with this project, I can show you some of the preliminary data. But there's a lot more like long term challenges that are associated with this. And the digestate can come from many different origins. So what I'm saying here is that I'm going to show a case study of the brewery industry but it's not necessarily limited to this particular one. So we used this because we had access to the diastate from the brewery. So we were able to use quite a lot of it and that's why we're able to produce the concrete. And there were particular reasons for uh, picking the brewery industry. And one of them is that they do are very concerned about sustainability. And like when it comes to concrete, they actually use a lot of liter uh, to liters of water to produce liters of beer. And besides that, they also produce a lot of waste, so a lot of solid waste. And that's why in general they've taken some surveys on this and they looked at different breweries within Europe. Uh, most of them have a very high commitment to sustainability because they end up with a lot of waste and they like to, you know, find other uses for it. And the government is also actively stimulating this by having certain initiatives where, for instance, the Renewable Heat Incentive, which was um, opened in 2011, it gave these particularly microbreweries, it gave them a kind of financial reward for running their equipment on biogas and biofuel. So it might be that some of these breweries also have a financial interest in order to look at the sustainability aspect, and that would really stimulate it. Now, when it comes to that digestate, we know that it has the right composition for what we want to do. So we were able to take a lot of samples. It was quite consistent and started applying this into the concrete. And here you can see what it looks like. So looking at it, it looks like concrete. Yeah? 
Um, I'll show you a bit more about the mechanical strengths and some of the other aspects later on so you can have a look at it. But here I'm just going to show you some of like the key bits of analysis that we did and showing obviously there is still a lot else that we kind of want to investigate. So first of all, we looked at what we had before we put this into the concrete. So we looked at the elemental composition. So here you can see some of the sulfurs present there. We looked at the pH, which is quite important because surprisingly concrete is quite alkaline. Um, but in the next lecture, I will actually go into more details on the chemistry behind concrete because you will see this will have, um, when we start adding in extra things such as the digestate, uh, some of these processes that are occurring over time will have an impact on that. So we had a solid contact of around 10%. So it was still quite liquidly, but there were still uh, uh, a decent amount of solids present. So you have to imagine that that might interfere with it as well. And then we looked at some of the ions uh, that were present. And we did this at different ratios. So first of all, you obviously, when you make a particular batch, we want to have a control sample where we keep everything exactly the same. And we might have to adjust, I said like the workability is quite an important factor. So the amount of water that we had to use, we had to kind of make sure that it was the same for all of them. So we had a proper control. Then we looked at replacing it with 25%, 50% of the digestate, 100% and 75%. And we compared all of those in terms of their mechanical strength over time. And what did we get? Now, when we were looking at these tests, you have to look at the curing age over time. And Ideally, you obviously want to do this for a much longer time. You want to look at it for at least up to like a year or nine months. But you have to imagine these were only preliminary results. So first of all, you just look at seven days and you can see that as it starts curing over time, the concrete is actually strengthened. So again, in the next lecture, we'll go into more details on how um, the, the chemistry behind the concrete. So taking a longer time, 28 days, you can see that the strength goes up compared to seven days. And for most of them, you would say that like looking at the control and comparing them, that roughly between the control and the 25% and 50%, there was no significant difference. So we looked at multiple measurements, no significant difference in mechanical strength. The only thing we saw when we went to slightly uh, higher concentrations by fully replacing it, that seemed to have some kind of effect on the mechanical strength. So fully replacing uh, the water with the digestate is probably not the best option. But we would need to meet, uh, we need to get more data in order to establish this. Again, like with the digestate, you have uh, different guidelines you need to adhere to. The same is the case for the concrete. So concrete, you have different applications you want to look at. I think you can imagine that for instance, concrete in a bridge is not quite the same as concrete that you want to have in your house. So not all of them need to withstand the same level uh, of strength in order to pass. So we looked at certain classifications and then we classified them according to particular ranges. But as you can see, these results are quite promising after like a limited amount of days. Now, all of these results were gathered before the pandemic kicked in. So the good thing about this is, is that we still have some concrete that's been left for quite a while and we'll be able to measure that as soon as people are able to go back to labs. And then the quick question, this was only the first part of the lecture. How do we go from here? So you've just seen some preliminary results that were showing, yes, potentially we could look at replacing uh, water in concrete and thereby improving sustainability with digestate. But we really need a lot more understanding behind the process. So we've only shown you uh, the results for seven days and 28 days. What happens over time? So you really want to do like a type of dynamic analysis to monitor a couple of important processes and see how they change over time. Particularly if we think that there might be a higher level of sulfur in a digestate than normal water, how would this affect the strength later on? So failure at a later stage. So is there any influence of potentially of bacteria that are present in the digestate? 
even though you can think that potentially when you make concrete they are under quite harsh conditions so would they not degrade we don't know uh, another thing was looking at leaching tests where we can look at a much wider uh, range of compounds than before and simply reproducibility we've looked at three different ones but we need to look at a much wider range to draw appropriate conclusions and the key, key question from all of this is, because obviously most of you are working with industry, is this economically feasible? So even though we are working with waste, is it really, well, first of all, you need to think about all the energy that goes into the process, also from a sustainability aspect, but is this economically feasible and is this an, an interesting alternative for companies or might they not consider it? So in all of this, particularly in uh, the more details of the chemical process for concrete, I will talk about this in the next lecture. If you want to have a look at what we do in bioreactors in general, because obviously an anaerobic digestion takes place in a bioreactor. So for a brief introduction onto bioreactors, I recommend that you have a look at this particular video. And I look forward to see you again for part two of this video.